Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Today we're going to be speaking to Rachel Wright, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her history of of kidney disease, but she's also going to talk to us how she managed to work while on in-center hemodialysis. She has an incredible story, and I'm so happy to have a chance to speak to her today. Uh, welcome to the show, Rachel. Uh, thank you so much, Lori, for having me on the show today. So tell me a little bit about when you were diagnosed with kidney disease. Yes, I was initially diagnosed when I was 16 years of age. I started having some swelling in my joints that did not go down, and my parents actually took me into urgent care. They did some tests and noticed that I did have some protein in my urine, and from there, they referred me to a nephrologist, and I'd say probably about one week later, I was actually diagnosed with glomerulonephritis and spoke to surgeons there and told that eventually I might need a kidney transplant. And you were, how old were you at this time? I was 16. Oh, man. You were thinking about getting your driver's license, not hearing you need a transplant, yeah, right? Yeah, driver's license, thinking about going out of state to college. This was during the summer. I was actually taking summer school classes. So, yeah, I definitely did not expect to get a diagnosis of that magnitude. So when did you actually have to, you know, I, I like to use the word, I guess, submit to dialysis because you have to kind of submit to it. <laughs> yes, I did have, I think, about probably 15 years before I actually had to go on hemodialysis. Okay. But up until that period, um, I was placed on a kidney transplant list uh, during my 20s because that did have um, an effect on, you know, the dwindling decrease of my kidney function. So that did happen around my 20s. I did also have a kidney transplant in my 20s that unfortunately you know, rejected. And so I did intermittently go on dialysis at that point. So I definitely can remember my first, first dialysis and the doctor actually telling me that, you know, the time has come. (laughs) That's not a good news when you hear it, you know, in that that, uh, context when they're talking to dialysis, you know. The time has come. Okay. What's the bad news? Yeah. Exactly. Nobody ever says, the time has come, you won the lottery, right? Yes. (laughs) Well, so you um, basically, you had a transplant in your 20s. It was kind of rocky. And and so tell us a little bit about your career, because I think, you know, our listeners want to hear about how you maintained going to work and and active and despite some of the different uh, challenges you were having. Yes. I did when I was initially diagnosed, um, my parents did tell me, you know, this isn't going to stop what you're going to do. You still want to go to school out of state, which I did. Um, just had a nephrologist out of state. I mean, I traveled a long distance. I lived in Maryland and I went to school in Madison, Wisconsin, you know, oh, wow. still maintain going to the doctor and doing all those kinds of things. And then when I moved back to Maryland, I, you know, got a full-time job. And in between working, you know, I did have decreased kidney function, and it basically completely stopped. There, you know, when that first diagnosis, and you think, okay, well, maybe it'll be turned around. It did not turn around. Um, I did work, and um, this past, uh, I had a kidney transplant in 2016, but up until that, I was on dialysis for eight years, 
And I continued to work a full-time job. I adjusted my schedule where I was getting up at 6 a.m. I had to be to work by 8.30. I worked 8.30 to 5. I worked dialysis. Yeah, work, exactly. I worked <laughs> your, dialysis your second from job. <laughs> 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I did that for eight years. Wow. And may I ask, what, what do you do? I mean, it must have been some kind of fun job to get you out of bed every morning. I actually was a insurance financial advisor. So I worked for a company where the culture, you know, was one of you had to be there, you had to be there, even though you had access to, you know, work from home, you know, just the culture of the job was not conducive to doing that. So there was definitely some issues with my employer in the beginning because they had no idea what hemodialysis was. I had to kind of you know, give a teaching moment and explain to them that it wasn't something that was optional. I actually needed these days off and I needed this time, you know, a schedule change. So, I mean, I can remember telling my employer and they were like, well, what is, what is that? And, you know, is it going to be forever? They think it was just something you do temporary. Okay. And then you'll be back on your regular schedule. But I had to explain to them, no, this will be until I get a kidney transplant. So I did have to go on FMLA because they had a very strict policy of, you know, calling out of, you know, if I was sick and I could not make it um, in on the scheduled time. So I definitely had to take advantage of that avenue to protect my job. But, you know, I did do that for eight years. Well, and what's really interesting, and I've worked in different jobs when I've, you know, you you have a chronic illness, and it's so amazing because, you know, doctor's appointments aren't available on Sunday and after work, and you have to do a lot of things to accommodate yourself, and it's it's challenging when you have a, a, a job or a situation that isn't accommodating. Yes, um, I and- definitely made it up in my mind that, You know, initially early on when I started my career that everything that I was going to do before I was diagnosed, I was not going to let dialysis kind of be my life. You know, like everything revolve around dialysis. I worked very hard to make sure, you know, I still was able to travel. I still was able to go to school and take other classes. I still was able to go to conferences. It just means I had to do a little extra planning. That's what it meant for me. Well, let's say, for instance, maybe you can provide some examples of, you know, going to work and you, you know, you have to take some time off or whatever. How would you start the conversation? Because you're very confident. And I know a lot about when you speak to people about your illness, if you go into the the employers and you're like, you know, I'm kind of sick and I need some time off. And, you know, it's it, and but if you go in and say, oh, you know, I have this illness I have to take care of and I need this it's all on how you say it. Like you, you yeah. say it with confidence in that, hey, buddy, this is what I need and don't give me any slack. Yes. Yeah. Well, it took me a long time to get to that point because I was a very independent person. I didn't want to ask anyone for everything, anything, and even friends. It was hard for me to kind of rely on that, but I realized that I was just one person, and I needed, you know, a group around me to support me. I didn't have any family members in Maryland, So I did rely on a support system of, you know, friends and associates, people I worked with. But I remember the first day that I walked in and I knew I was going to have to tell my immediate supervisor that my schedule needed to change. Oh, and by the way, it needs to change Monday and today is Wednesday. That's because, you know, the doctor called me and told me. So I can remember when we (laughs) sat down and I told her, I said, you know, this is very hard for me. I said, you know, when I'm coming to work, I'm here to work. You have my full attention. I said, but I've been diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, 
And the doctor is saying that on Monday, I'm going to have to start hemodialysis, and this is what it means. And I think once we had that conversation and she heard doctor, (laughs) and, you know, I provided doctor's information, I think it became a little more real because me just coming in and say, hey, you know, I need to change my schedule because of this, this, and this, because I think I mentioned doctor, here's the doctor's information. Do you need me to confirm anything? Do you need, and the doctor had already told me, if I need to get on the phone with someone on your behalf, I will be more than willing to do that. So it made it a little bit easier, but it definitely was a conversation that I dreaded because my employer, my immediate supervisor, was not receptive to time off, sick or otherwise. Well, and, you know, we we talk about protections we have in the United States, like reasonable accommodations. Correct. And, you know, it doesn't mean that your immediate supervisor is aware of those. And they may need to be educated by human resources because we are protected when we work under the American Disabilities Act. And, you know, they could get sued for not giving you the time off. Exactly. And I (laughs) did. um, I know when, you know, the conversation was presented to higher management, of course, I mean, their only thing was just write it down on paper. That was their only thing. And they submitted it to human resources. And, of course, it was approved. But having that initial conversation with, you know, my immediate supervisor, I don't think she was aware of, you know, maybe the exact procedures required as far as disability acts. I think she probably had some information regarding FMLA. But, yeah, definitely um, I can see where they could have been liable if, you know, the conversation had gone a different route. Well, and the thing, too, is that you're working with people and you want to like the people and you want to feel like you're valued. And if somebody's sitting there like looking at you like, wow, you want to get the day off and you, you know, you're doing, you know, they think you're 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 playing hooky doing dialysis. I mean, I think I would rather run a marathon. I don't know about you, but uh, something, you know, they don't quite understand Um, And so to be in a culture where people don't have empathy for you can be, you know, a a reason to maybe not want to go to work if you don't feel so good. I mean, you know what? You know, I could say, well, God, why do I need this this crap? You know, I should just and and we have to push through as as you did because of the fact that, um, you know, working is such a part of quality of life. And then I imagine you able were you were able to get insurance, too which helped a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, I did have insurance through my employer, and I was also able to get additional insurance through uh, my state financial um, program. So that definitely helped, you know, with my different treatment options. But, you know, it is very hard. I don't think people realize, you know, how much people are doing when they're on dialysis just being on dialysis, if you take work out of the picture, that is a full-time job. You know, it is mental, not alone, but, you know, physically as well. I mean, there were some days that I went to work that I said, you know, I, I'm too tired. I, I just cannot, you know, function through the whole day. And then I had to sit an additional three hours. And probably by the time I got home, it's, you know, almost 10, and then to get up the next day and work eight hours, it's very hard, and until I think people see it, you know, like I had, you know, posted something on Facebook, like a day that I did where I, you know, just posted everything that was going on, and then, you know, bringing different friends into the treatment facility to actually see what it is. I think that helps people out tremendously. And then just the support system, talking to other patients, um, you know, letting them know that maybe you can't do the same type of work, but maybe you might be able to work part-time or, you know, you might have a passion for something that you could continue to do while you're in Dallas. 
Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I was on dialysis from age 12 to 24. And I started working at a flower shop when I was 18. And I've worked ever since. <laughs> and I, I've, you know, I mean, I mean, it, you know, I've, I've consistently worked because I, so much of, you know, my being is, is working, you know, you just, it's like a routine, you know, you just, yeah. you feel the need to. And you know, for a short, for about a year, I, w- I had to get up and do home hemo. I went at four o'clock in the morning. So, and then I went to work afterwards. And, you know, it was challenging, but I, I preferred that because I was, you know, wanted to have my evenings free. But um, my question is, you know, the majority of that time I was on home dialysis. Now, did you ever consider, you know, doing home to make work a little bit easier, you know, with having it, your own schedule to do dialysis? I know the doctor did mention different treatment options to me, but because I didn't have anybody in the home, it was just myself, I really did not feel comfortable in me doing all the procedures myself, plus putting myself on dialysis when there really wasn't another person in the house other than me. So that's kind of the issue that... um I was faced with, and that was one of the reasons that I did the in-center hemodialysis. Um, I know there was peritoneal dialysis that he mentioned, but I just did not feel comfortable with that. With Now, uh, so you worked up through, um, you know, getting a kidney transplant. So tell us a little bit about that. That's been about a couple of years. Yeah, I actually celebrated the two years uh, in July of this year, July 27th. Um, from there, I had a close friend that was a transplant coordinator where I was listed, and she had called me I probably a week before the transplant and told me there was a possibility that I would be getting a transplant. So, of course, uh, as you probably know this, that when you hear a possibility, that's... <laughs> That's not a confirmation that, you know, I, which, when I heard that, I just was like, okay, keep going. I didn't stop to get excited or anything. So, you know, they had just told me that there was a possibility that a kidney would be coming available. Someone would uh, call me from my transplant um, center and confirm everything probably in a few days or next week. And when I got the call, it was, probably about 3 a.m., and they said uh, kidney was available, asked me, you know, that, was I still interested? Of course, yes, you're interested. And then we started the process of going to the hospital, checking in. I had to be at the hospital 6 a.m., but my surgery didn't turn out to be until 7 p.m. that evening, and I was in the hospital for seven days. You know what, when you said your surgery was at 7 p.m. at night, how hungry were you? Oh, yeah, of course, because you you, figure you, you haven't had anything to midnight the day before. <laughs> then you have surgery. Then you can't have anything the next day. You're not even on water at this point. I have nothing. I so, yeah, it's at least two or three days before you can you know, hopefully have broth. <laughs> well, I always tell people, you know, when you have to schedule surgery, uh, if it's if it's a scheduled surgery, always ask the doctor, hey, I want to be the first up. What date can you do? Because, exactly. you know, if you let them schedule it, they're like, well, you're going to come in at one o'clock in the afternoon, which means, you know, nothing to eat or drink and be nervous about the surgery. So um, because you can't eat after midnight. <laughs> But I, of course. I always um, think of that. And so what are your kidneys doing well? What's your creatinine? My kidney is doing well. Last uh, creatinine was 1.2. So I've been in the 1.2 to 1.4 range for about the last two years. And my schedule for clinic follow-up has kind of spread out. So I'm now seeing um, the transplant clinic. Roughly every, I want to say, eight weeks, but in between that time, um, I'm seeing my nephrologist. So I'm still seeing, you know, they don't want to kind of put you too far out there. I'm still seeing a doctor in between those times. So I have not had um, 
any issues on that. So what are you doing now professionally? Are you still at the same job? Are you running the place yet? No, I'm not at that <laughs> uh, job for the insurance company. I actually started my own motivational speaking company in 2017, speaking about my journey through kidney disease, how, you know, I was diagnosed at 16, went to school out of state, continued to work. So just offering motivational tips, not only to transplant patients, but to anyone who has had a debilitating illness and maybe has felt like, you know, that's it. You know, I've been diagnosed. My life is over. I can't do the same things that I used to do. So just providing that support and talking with different patients, business owners, and, you know, different people regarding the experience, hoping that can help them. Well, and, you know, it's so important to educate people about, you know, surviving and thriving and then also, you know, helping people understand that, you you know, kidneys aren't that sexy. So um, people just don't even realize that kidneys are the master chemist and all the different things they do. There's just a lot of room for education. And, you know, it, it's so interesting you say that because I don't know if you've ever heard of Toastmasters. Uh, I, yes. I joined Toastmasters in 1993, and it took me... Um, I started competing in contests, and I guess my claim to fame of Toastmasters is I met my husband there because he was in the audience. And we've been married a little over 21 years, but the skills I learned at Toastmasters has taken me all over the world to give presentations. And it's just, it's so wonderful to be able to share your story, yeah. motivate others, and, you know, and uh, let them know they're not alone and that there's hope. Uh, you know, it's so important that people understand that just because you're given a diagnosis doesn't mean, you know, your life is over. You can still continue to do the things you do, just like you said, work, you lived alone. I mean, the fact that, you know, you were a young girl and you, your parents felt that you could go off to college and I, I think that's so wonderful of your parents because I often hear uh, some of the parents of my teens who come to the prom er, that, that I throw every year, that they just, you know, they don't let their kids experience life. And, and the whole purpose of going through an illness or going through life is to live life. So it's a, it's a balance to, you know, take precautions, but go out and pursue the dreams and, and the life that you were meant to live. And, you know, it's so wonderful that you've, you've done that. So. Well, thank you. I definitely feel like there is a lot more to do with organ donation. I mean, I had several people. A uh, friend who asked me, "Well, how you know how do they do the surgery? Did they take out so? Did they take out your kidneys? Where do they place the new kidney?" So there's definitely room for I think a lot more education and a lot more uh, people that might be willing to donate kidneys that don't even know that you know you don't really need two kidneys. You, you can donate one and you can still live a very full life with one kidney. It's so true. It's uh, people are just don't realize that. And uh, you often hear stories in the media that people learn that they just had one kidney. And then some people have three kidneys. I'm like, well, that's yeah. it's just it's just crazy. But, you know, the average person has two kidneys. So in closing, anything you'd like to say to people listening, considering about, uh, you know, should I keep my job? What should I do? Um, any any kind of words of wisdom? I would definitely say to talk to your employer uh, about your situation because every situation is different. Every employer is different. And I think it makes a very big difference that you have the support of your employer um, and how you feel when you're coming to work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you can, I would suggest continue to work. It definitely gives you a broader outlook on life and you don't feel like dialysis has trapped you and that you have no way out. You know, dialysis when you're working just becomes a little part of that three hour window that you have. And I think if you're able to work and keep that in mind, it, you know, it 
it is a fuller life until you can get a kidney transplant. Well, and it is. It's, uh, you know, too much free time on your hands and being on dialysis is not a good combination. It is not. <laughs> so uh, if you can't work, you need to volunteer, you need to get out and be active and, and do what you can because it's a really easy illness to become depressed in. And if you're is, sitting yeah. there looking at four walls and watching the news all day, I guarantee you you're going to be depressed. So, exactly. Um, so, well, thank you so much. It was wonderful to speak with you, Rachel, and I love hearing stories of this, and um, I look forward to staying in contact with you and, and hearing about your future um, accomplishments. Oh, thank you, Lori, for having me on the show. This has been a pleasure just to get the word out there and share my journey with everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.